Okay, friends. So on this video, we get to talk about how to solve quadratic equations. And I'm willing to wager that if you did any high school at all, some teacher at some point asked you to solve that quadratic equation, x squared minus 6x plus 8 equals 0. And you said, ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me, I know how to factor. And because I know how to factor, I know that this x squared tells me I've got x's in those slots. I need numbers that multiply to positive 8, but add to negative 6. And so I choose negative 4 and negative 2. And sure enough, x squared minus 4x minus 2x, that's minus 6x, plus 8 is 0. So then we use something called the zero product property. And the zero product property says if I have a product and that product is equal to zero, then either this equals zero or that equals zero. That's the only way to get a product of zero is if one of the factors is zero. In the case on the left, x happens to be four. And in the case on the right, x happens to be 2. Those are the two values of x that solve the quadratic. You need both of them. x equals 4, x equals 2. You should come to class ready with a solution to x squared minus 10x plus 24 equals 0. That is something you should come to class ready to solve. Now, wait a second. What if things get a little bit more complicated? What if we start with, instead of an equal sign, what if we say 5x squared minus 11x plus 2 is greater than 0? So instead of an equation, you get an inequality. Well, how do you solve that? Well, oddly enough, you solve it roughly the same way. We need factors, and we set that product positive. So 5 times 2 is 10. We're going to look for factor pairs of 10. 10 and 1 work. 5 and 2 work. Negative 10 and negative 1 work. Negative 5 and negative 2 work. We're looking for the factor pair that adds up to negative 11. That's this factor pair. So we have 5x squared minus 10x minus 1x plus 2. And this has a common factor. And this has a common factor, but I really want an x minus 2 there. So what do I have to pull out of here to get an x minus 2? Oh, yeah, it looks like that. And so I have two factors. I have x minus 2, and I have 5x minus 1. So now what? Well, the zero product property doesn't apply here because I don't have a product of zero. I have a product that's positive. And so I have to think way, way back, old school. How do I get a product that's positive? Well, I could have this one be positive and this one be positive, or I could have this one be negative and this one be negative, and those are just tricky to keep track of. So instead, let's use our friend the number line. What, pray tell, is the graph of y equals that? That's right, it's a parabola. And parabolas have this really weird habit. They start positive, and then they go negative, and then they come back positive again if, in fact, you've got a positive coefficient on the x squared. So if I knew the two places where the parabola hit the axis, I would know the parabola is positive on one side and then negative in the middle and then positive on the other side. So where are those two places? Well, these two places are the places where the parabola is either zero or undefined. The parabola is never undefined. So it's zero at x equals one-fifth, and it's zero when x equals two. 
Now, what do I want? I want to know when the parabola is positive, when the parabola is above the x-axis. And since I want to know where the parabola is above the x-axis, I want to pick the places where the graph is positive, and that happens if x is less than one-fifth or greater than two. Some people write this in interval notation. Uh, this interval runs from negative infinity to one-fifth, where one-fifth is not included. This interval runs from two to infinity, where two is not included. Infinity is never included because infinity is not a number. So when we have an inequality, we have an extra step. We factor, yes, and then we consider the behavior of the graph of the, of the quadratic function. We consider where that is positive and negative, and we use that information to obtain the desired subintervals. Hopefully, you remember a little bit of that from high school, and hopefully you come to class ready to solve that. Negative 6x squared plus 23x minus 15 is less than zero. You should come to class ready to do that. Yeah, but George, you're asking, what if I have something that isn't factorable? x squared minus 6x minus 6 is 0. What if I have something that is not factorable? Well, I offer two possibilities for you. One is to use this thing called completing the square. When we complete the square, it is helpful for us to kick that constant term over to the right side. When we complete the square, we are looking for the number that literally completes the square. This factor on the left side, this, uh, this expression on the left side, can be x minus somebody squared. And we want this expression on the left side to be x minus something squared. So what's going to do that? Well, when I multiply a binomial by itself, I get this number twice on a linear term. So if I'm going to get this number twice on a linear term, and that's going to turn into negative 6x, that number is 3. This is halved. The thing is, when you expand x minus 3 squared, you get x squared minus 3x minus 3x plus 9. And that's what we add to both sides. That's what we add. 6 plus 9 is 15. And now it just remains to solve an equation in complete square form. How do we get rid of this squared? We take a square root. We take both the positive and the negative square roots. And then what happens? We kick the 3 over to the right side, and we get 3 plus or minus radical 15. 3 plus or minus radical 15. And you're thinking, are you kidding? How am I supposed to do all that? Isn't there some nice formula we can just memorize? And the answer is, sort of. The other way to skin this cat is with something called the quadratic formula. Now, the quadratic formula, your teacher will probably prove for you, and I imagine there's plenty of proofs on YouTube. To prove the quadratic formula, you complete the square on a generic quadratic. Failing that, this formula is in the IB formula booklet. Negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So negative b, this is b. That's b. The opposite of negative 6 is 6 plus or minus the square root of 
negative 6 squared minus 4 times a times c, that's c, over 2a. Well, wait a second. What's in parentheses there? 60. This doesn't look a thing like that. This does not look a thing like that unless you simplify the radical. And then you start thinking, oh, this is the same as that. And you'd be right. So whether you complete the square or you use the quadratic formula, you get the same answer. Now, mind you, we could come at this from a graphical standpoint. If we come at this from a graphical standpoint, we graph x squared, oh, this has to work, x squared minus 6x minus 6. And when we graph that parabola, we figure out where this is by finding a 0 and where this is by finding a 0. And it turns out that this is at 6.87-ish, and this is at negative 0.873-ish. And those numbers happen to be 3 plus radical 15 and 3 minus radical 15, approximately. So completing the square gives you the same answer the quadratic formula gives. If you don't need exact answers, if approximate answers will do, you can use your calculator things you should come to class ready to do. You should come to class having solved x squared minus 8x plus 5 equals 0. That's going to involve kicking this puppy over and completing the square. You should also come to class ready to solve that. 3x squared plus 6x minus 4 is less than or equal to 0, which means there's going to be some portion of the number line. Parabola is positive and then negative and then positive again, because that's a positive 3x squared. Your job is to figure out where those are. And then what are we going to choose? We're going to choose the part of the number line for which the parabola is negative or zero. We're going to choose that part. One other thing to talk about. Here's the quadratic formula. Here's the quadratic formula. This part, the part that is under the radical, that part is called the discriminant. The discriminant is usually abbreviated delta because it makes the sound d for discriminant. That's b squared minus 4ac. Now, here's the kicker with the discriminant. I love the discriminant because the discriminant tells us the kinds of roots we're going to get before we get them. Think about it. If the discriminant is positive, if the discriminant is positive, then I have a number plus or minus the square root of a positive number over a number. This is all legit. There are two real roots. Uh, side note, la, uh, those roots are rational if b squared minus 4ac is a perfect square. But what happens if the discriminant is zero? What happens if red box here is zero? Well, then I have negative b plus zero and negative b minus zero. Wait a second. Negative b plus zero and negative b minus zero, that's the same number. So there aren't two real roots anymore. There's only one real root. Technically speaking, it's a double root, but there's only one. What happens if the discriminant is negative? I've got negative b plus or minus the square root of a negative number. Well, it's really hard to take the square root of a negative number. Radical negative number, I don't know about that. There are no real roots in that case. If you're one of those graphical people, if the discriminant is positive, 
the graph of the associated parabola hits the axis twice. If you are graphing a quadratic whose discriminant is zero, that parabola is ever so gently kissing the axis just once. If the discriminant is negative, then the associated parabola never touches the axis. There are no real roots. So you've got connections between graphs of parabolas and values of the discriminant and the quadratic formula. They all flow together. So if I just want to know how many real roots does 3x oh, squared minus 9x minus 11 equals 0 have, then I just compute the discriminant, which is b squared minus 4ac, and that's, oh my, 81 plus, you've got to be kidding, 132, and that's 213, which is positive. So there are two real roots, two real distinct roots. You should come to class ready to talk about how many real roots the equation negative 2x squared plus 4x minus 7 equals 0 has. You should be able to find the discriminant and come up with the number of real roots. These are questions we will ask you to do when you show up tomorrow. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody.